Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, nice and very lively workshop, uh, Ser uh, Sergei, uh, Cesare and Rosa for inviting me to Mainz and take part in this, uh, in this event. Now, my talk is uh, very similar to the last two talks in a way. So it's uh, a bit same, same, but different. So you will see similar things, but maybe in a slightly different perspective. Um, I will talk about iridates and osmates, but I don't want to focus that much on one specific material. So I don't take a material and try to explain every property that can happen there. But I try to do it from a more general perspective and want to study uh, how strong correlations and spin orbit coupling interact with each other. So as you know, um, we deal with materials here um, that have a lot of parameters. Yeah. When I started working in, in, in many body physics, I did work on high TCs. So you had the exchange coupling J and every, everything should follow. So it was easy from that respect. And now for some crazy reason, we ended up in these materials where you have lambda, you have J, you have U, you have a crystal field, you have the doping and a lot of things that you have to consider. And I think what we are trying to do now is to, to do some cuts through this high dimensional phase diagram and try to understand a, a little bit of what's going on when we change a few of these parameters, keeping others fixed. Yeah? And what I want to do here is study the interaction between basically the lambda, the interaction parameter, and the doping. Yeah? Doping meaning the filling of, the, of these uh, um, D shells that I'm dealing with. Yeah? So I'm in the, okay, this doesn't work. I, I have to remember. Um, I'm in the lucky situation that um, I don't need to do a lot of introduction, which uh, saves some time for lunch. That's good. So uh, I just want to tell you what I'm interested in. So for instance, uh, this is what uh, Paitao already discussed. So you have this, uh, this series of materials. And at, at the time when this came up, it was a surprise that iridates can be insulating, yeah, because it's a 5D material. And you, up to this point, it was considered to be rather uncorrelated. Electrons are uh, not so localized. Uh, Hubbard interactions should be small. So this is better. It's the same. Okay. Please continue. I just close it. Okay, that's better, yeah. And this is this is the point. Yeah. Okay. So that's the standard story. You all know this. Um, but one question, for instance, that I want to answer is the following. So there is the rhodate, so strontium two, uh, rhodium O four, and there is the iridate which are basically isoelectronic. So if you count electrons, like a chemist, you would say they have the same filling, uh, they have the same electron count, so you have these five electrons in the D-shell. Um, so why is the rhodate metal and why is the iridate an insulator? So Paitao did the following, he took the iridate and doped it by rhodium. So that's a very similar question, it's an isoelectronic doping or uh, substitution. So why should this be a doping at all? from a chemist's point of view. So this is a question which I will not answer. But uh, here I want to look at the difference between these two end members, so to say, and why rhodate is a metal and iridate is an insulate. So this we will see at some point. Yeah? Okay, so um, still I need to do like this. Uh, I will skip this uh, because uh, you have learned so much about iridates uh, already, so uh, it's not so important. This you also have seen already. It's the sketch of the, the orbital um, levels that uh, we are dealing with in these 5D transition metal oxides. Um, and what I want to do is to concentrate on this subset, yeah, as usual. We heard already in the morning that the EGs that are up here, they are not really affected by the spin orbit coupling. So the diagonal terms in these uh, orbitals are zero. However, this was also mentioned, there is a hybridization through the spin orbit coupling between these two, so neglecting this is some kind of approximation. That's not really exact, but it's an approximation. It's a good approximation if the splitting here is large, which is a couple of EVs, so that's fine. So I will concentrate on this so-called T2G subset, and the splitting between these two guys is given by the spin orbit coupling, yeah? This we also know. Um, what do I want to do really? So before I go to the materials, I want to look at this from a model perspective. So I want to, to find a very simplistic model that has not so many parameters, but that allow to play a little bit with the basic ingredients. Yeah? So what we do is the following. We take a, a beta lattice. 
So in the DMFT community, this is very prominent because the beta lattice allows to solve DMFT kind of exactly. So um, there is not a DMFT approximation involved in this, uh, in this uh, calculation. Anyhow, what happens? You have now um, these two orbitals, one you label J3 half and one you label J1 half. And by spin orbit coupling, these two shift with, with I mean, one shifts down, one shifts up. Uh, but there's not an immediate gap, yeah? The gap occurs only if the spin orbit coupling is large enough to overcome the bandwidth, which is finite. So this is something but it's sometimes forgotten that spin orbit coupling needs to be at some strength uh, to uh, fully polarize the system. And this polarization will be important in the following. Um, now, this is the spin orbit Hamiltonian, which couples the orbital and the spin degrees of freedom. So this is formulated in the original cubic harmonics and the original spin. So uh, this is uh, as usual. And now the Hamiltonian here, the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian, is diagonal in the so-called J basis. Yeah? This is uh, something you heard of. When people talk about J effective 1 half, J effective 3 half, it's nothing else than the basis transformation that diagonalizes this Hamiltonian, giving you a diagonal representation of, this, uh, of these states. Um, we have to do this in practice. Um, that's different to the approach of Sergei, I guess, because we are, we are working with a quantum Monte Carlo solver where we are dealing with sign problems and you need an as diagonal basis as possible to overcome the sign problem and to, to make calculations feasible. If you do diagonalization, you can do it in any basis and the result should be basis independent, of course. Yeah? Um, so, <coughs> excuse me? Segment code, so the segment version. This is no, it's not the segment version, it's the full. Yeah, I will come to this, that this is important. It's really the full hybridization matrix, uh, matrix code. Yeah? Um, but um, what happens in this, uh, in this transformation? And this is maybe something I want to explain a little bit better. I realized in the talk of Sergei that this might be useful to think of. Um, now, I had no time to prepare a slide, but maybe I, I can do it on the blackboard a little bit. So this is the transformation for the J1 half terms, right? So um, you combine the x, y, the x, z, and the y, z with different spins to a new object. So this is a transformation that incorporates the spin. So if I go back one slide, you will see that here you have a spin. So this Hamiltonian you have to transform also. This you must not forget. But now you get a, a different object, yeah? which is formulated in the new quantum numbers. And now we, we do the following. We take this magnetic quantum number as the new spin quantum number in the way. And we can write the Hamiltonian. I, I hope that I can do it now uh, live. So you have a Hamiltonian which is one for the one half part and one for the three half part. And then one that mixes these two. Yeah? So if the, the splitting between these two guys, if lambda is large enough, is large enough, then you forget about this for the time being. Yeah? For this term, you, you end up with something which is u minus 4 over 3 times n, and let's call this plus 1 half and minus 1 half. So this has the form of n up and down. So this would be a Hubbard type interaction. This is this guy. Now for the 3 half, you get something like min u minus j times n plus 3 half and minus 3 half plus and plus one half and minus one half. Remember that these are not the same because this lives in the three half subset. Plus, and then the second term, u minus seven over three, op, j, and then here are all the other density terms. All the other, yeah? Now, this is the difference to the original Hamiltonian. In the original Hamiltonian, we had uh, the Hubbard type interaction, and then you have the the Holmes rule, yeah, which aligns spin. So that's exactly the energy difference of J. So this gives you an additional energy J compared to this state. So if you formulate this in these new quantum numbers, this difference is gone. Yeah? So this is not the same. So if you transform uh, the Hamiltonian into the J basis, the interaction is different. And this will be particularly important for n equal two, two electrons, because then Holmes rule is important. So we will see that. Um, Spin orbit coupling compared to a standard crystal field, if you have only one of the two, not both together, will have a 
very different effect on the correlations. Yeah? Okay. So, so there is no uh, <coughs> terms against this. Or Plus spin flip, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just writing down the density, density, because here you see a different. I mean, there are a lot of other terms. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. In your methodology, you have actually crystal field bigger than spin orbit coupling for those materials which were uh, Actually, then there is no chance to neglect those mixed terms. If no, the spin orbit is small compared to the crystal field, there is no chance. No, we don't neglect it. No, 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 no. Um, there are two crystal fields, yeah? There's one which pushes the EGs out. Um, and then what I, what I want to say, crystal field, is the splitting between these two, which comes from lambda. So if lambda is large enough... Okay, that's not crystal field. Yeah, it's not, I'm, I was a bit... Yeah. yeah. The point is the following. What I will discuss then at, at some point in this talk is uh, you can think of, and I'll go back just one slide. You can think of this just as a crystal field within the T2G coming from a tetragonal distortion. Yeah, This would give you a crystal field inside the T2G, like the Yantella. If you have no interactions, no. No, but if you have no interactions, you have only the, the spin orbit coupling. It gives you a split thing, which is 3 over 2 lambda. Yeah. No interactions. If you have just a crystal field, a tetragonal distortion, it gives you the same splitting with the delta. Yeah, different, different orbitals. But if you have no interactions, it's just a different basis. Well, no, but yes, yes, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. You no, if you do the calculations, set all interaction parameters to zero, you get exactly the same results for the phys for the observables that I have. No, this is not so important now. Okay, <laughs> let's continue. Uh, yes. When you neglect this, actually, uh, that is true when spin orbit coupling is larger, significantly larger than Kuhn's uh, coupling, because this mixing should be proportional to the Kuhn's coupling. Mm. It has nothing to do with uh, crystal field. I mean, what you are actually getting in part of the stuff, you are getting the Kuhn's coupling, because that will give you this mixed term. This mixed term is proportional to the Kuhn's coupling. Yes, but the lambdas that you need anyhow in the end to have a... Okay, I will come to this point. Okay? We are never neglecting this thing. In the calculation, this guy is never neglected. This is only neglected here to do this argument. Yeah? So the confusion is maybe I neglected here something. No term ever is neglected in the calculation. In the actual. Okay? Fine. Good. <laughs> okay. No, it was not such a good idea to do this on the fly. Okay, I see. I will skip this next time. Good. So, uh, we agree on this or we don't. Anyhow, so we can do something in the large limit of spin orbit coupling or crystal field. So, I do now two things. I introduce either a spin orbit coupling or a tetragonal crystal field. Yeah? Not both at the same time. So you can calculate the, the atomic charge gap in this limit. That means, um, for uh, depending on the on the electron count, uh, you consider only the three half Hamiltonian or the one half because one is either empty or filled. Yeah. So you can you you start, just separate this to infinity. Now you see that uh, all of this uh, n equal one, n equal three, n equal four is from the structure, very similar, except of a few changes in the prefactors. But there, is, uh, there are two differences, and they happen at n equal 2 and at n equal 5. Yeah? At n equal 2, the role of the Huns coupling changes sign. Yeah? What's your delta? What's the other? Delta is the tetragonal crystal field. Uh, in the, it pushes the, the x, c, y, c, down respective to the x. Why it is, uh, XC why it is only for N4 and not for all the other? Yeah. If you want to consider uh, what we call crystal field, you need to enter everything. But it's the large crystal field limit. Yeah. So then. Um, well, but this non huge crystal field which splits uh, T2G uh, triple. Then it should be entered everywhere except uh, 3. 
Um, because only and, and okay, now I know what you mean. This tetragonal crystal field for us is the following thing: you take the three t to g orbitals, yeah. yeah, and now you push two uh, two down and one up. What vice versa? No, only in this way, only this way, because then you have the spin orbit, the analogy to the spin orbit coupling. Now you push this to infinity. So only the case where you have four electrons, your excitation involves this guy. So then delta comes in. Yeah, but this never happens, right? So I mean, infinity never happens, we know, in, yeah. In, in your materials. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is not on real materials. <laughs> Let's forget that they are materials, yeah? No. If you have only three electrons, you do the excitations inside of this shell, so it doesn't matter how far this is gone, and it just needs to be far away. Yeah? Then the atomic gap is purely coming from inside of this. So Same it if you have only. Far away compared to Yes. 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 That's exactly what Natasha was asking. But in reality, it's the other way around. In more or less any real material, it's the other way around, right? That, that was the point. That lambda is smaller than the Hunsul coupling. Yes. yes, but in the 5D, but in the 5D lambda, no. Okay. Lambda may be compared with compared never much larger. In the iridate, lambda is 0.4 and the Hunsul is 0.2. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> These are okay. Okay, so let's put it maybe for some that Okay. I mean, you know, if one calculates the wound, the, the wounds uh, change, let's say the wounds. Let's let's go to the calculations, okay? So these were general arguments just to tell you that n equal 2 is kind of special. Yeah, maybe. Just take this. You can do this analysis not in the large limit of crystal field, but for finite and the formulas are complicated. I don't want to write it down, but you see this, the same trends that n equal 2 is kind of special. Yeah, okay. Now, let's go to one electron or one hole. Uh, this is the, uh, let's take one hole, then it's the iridate physics. Yeah. What happens? So if you uh, take no Hunswool coupling, that's the blue curve, and you play with lambda in this, uh, in this model, so in this beta lattice, um, and you go into the, what is the negative lambda, that is the, the, the one hole, you immediately see that you polarize the system. Yeah? So a finite lambda leads to a polarization, and this is the so-called quasi-particle randomization. When this is zero, you have an insulator. So on the n equal, five side, that's the iridate side, you quickly reduce your quasi-particle randomization to a very small, uh, to a very small value. And uh, this comes from the reduction of orbitals. I mean, this is what, uh, what people call this effective one orbital, J effective one half modeling of the iridates, yeah? But this happens only if you polarize the system, yeah? You need really a polarized system. And uh, maybe importantly, when this happens, uh, is at the very uh, comparably small value of lambda. Yeah, that's the special point about an, uh, one hole. Yeah, so lambda. In I don't understand. If you have only one electron, why do you worry about hood? Yes. There is no hood for one electron. Yes. yes there is no. Ah, uh, no, no, no. And only no, one electron. And there is no U for one electron. Because of self. <laughs> <laughs> because of self interaction, correct? This is now the relevant Hamiltonian for this guy. Yeah? So, why we worry about, uh, I mean, of course there is an interaction in one electron, that's the, the cuprate physics. If you have one band, then the Hubbard U is important. That's that correlated model. Yeah? <laughs> one electron in one band. So, correlations are the most prominent there. And Hunsul coupling comes in only from this transformation. It's important for motion of electrons. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
Okay, so here, uh, I mean, this is just the, the C as function of U. And uh, when you have uh, finite Hund's coupling, as, as you have, you see a small, uh, these are two different uh, values for the Hund's coupling. You see a small deviation of these two curves, but they come only from this transformation, yeah? So you might think that the Hund's coupling is not important in the one band description, but it is because you have to transform this. And this is the actual calculation. There's no, there's really no um, approximation to this. Okay, so what is the question? You can pose it to me. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with all this, right? I can live with that. Okay, so that is the, the year we did. Now, um, this is now the actual calculation um, for the real material. Um, you have the J effective one half and the J effective three half. And when you do the one year construction, uh, this is the first thing to, uh, to notice maybe, the J effective one half is not completely at N equals one if you do the one year construction. So it's at one point, let's call it 1.1 or 1.2. And the J three half are not completely filled. Yeah? from the outset. So if you want to do a calculation really including all the charge degrees of freedom, you should include all the three, um, all the three bands. Okay? Now if you do this, and what we also did is calculate the interaction values with constrained RPA. Now these values are a little bit different. First because you have to uh, first um, consider the, uh, the convention that you use. So this is what we call the uh, the Kanamori convention and not the, the Slate convention, so there's a bit of confusion about this. But the range of U and J is more or less the same that Paitao had. Yeah? So U is roughly around 2, a bit less or a bit larger, doesn't matter too much. And J is of the order 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in this one year functions. Yeah? If you take your spaces, this one year functions. And at what temperature do you do the calculations? The calculations are at room temperature. Both, right? Uh, this is this is ARPES, this is uh, the measurement, and this is the calculation. So the calculation is at room temperature. And you see in, uh, what happens, that um, correlations, they polarize this 1.1 to 1.0 and the J3 half get completely filled, so you get really this one band mod insulator. Yeah? And now comes the difference to the row date. If you start with the row date, um, you have a very similar band structure, but since you have no 5D element but a 4D element, the lambda is smaller. Yeah? Your spin orbit coupling is not 0.4 but 0.2, uh, roughly a factor of 2. That means your splitting of all these bands around the Fermi level is not as large, and you are not dealing with the one band model, and the three halves are filled, but one of the three halves is even very far away from a complete filling, and this is very far away from a n equal one filling. So what you end up with with a three quarter fill two band system for the row date, if you take just the row date. So in terms of multi-orbital physics, this never would, nobody would really say this is very prone to correlations. Yeah, you have two orbitals and three electrons. Excuse me. For the, for the rhodium, have you changed here the Coulomb parameters? Oh. Uh, until now, uh, no, we also calculated them. They are slightly smaller, but same ballpark. So um, here you have U is 0 0.6 or 0.8 in the different convention. The J is very similar. Yeah. Why is smaller? I have no idea. Really, I don't know. 4D is smaller than 5D. This is weird. Should be the way around, actually. If you take, uh, let's take ruthenium, the ruthenates. There the U is 2.3 in all these one-year bases. Right, that sort of sounds more natural, 1.6. And they, they, they both look too small for typical 14, don't they? Yeah. Are the band functions significantly different? Uh, for the rotate and the iridate? The one-year functions themselves, maybe not, but the screening is different because they are closer here. Here you have different, uh, different one-year functions, so the screening is a little bit different. But why? Uh, okay. So you, you, even J is smaller, right? And J is not screened. Which J is now smaller? I mean, I think that your J for rhodium, as you mentioned, is smaller than J for rutinium, isn't it? No, it's the same. same. The J is the same. J is the same. 
<laughs> okay, anyways, if we do the calculations with the parameters that we got from constrained RPA, the results even fit nicely to the experiment. Yeah, you get the metal, uh, you see the, the, the crossings. Okay, this should be here, this should be here uh, for, the two, uh, for the two pockets that you see in the experiment. Yeah? And also the, the quasi particle randomization, which you can also measure uh, from, from the slope of the, of the bands, for instance, that fits quite nicely. So you have an effective mass of m equal 2, more or less, in the row date. Hmm? Okay, so that was the, the one electron. But now comes uh, uh, the two electrons in three bands, and I want to start with something where there's no spin orbit coupling. So that's uh, what in correlated materials physics now is quite fashionable. That's this Hund's metals, Hund's rule induced correlations. Yeah? Not so much coming from, from the Hubbard U term, but from the Hund's rule exchange. And there is this, uh, um, this famous uh, way of uh, presenting this. That means that in, in two electrons, three orbital systems, or four electrons in two orbitals, which is the same, you have the possibility to have a very low coherence scale, so very bad metals, over a very long range of interaction parameters. Yeah? So normally you would, you would expect if the coherence scale goes very low, you're very close to a phase transition. But this is in fact not the case. You can do a lot with the systems, and that are, for instance, the ruthenates, the iron nictites, all these kind of materials, where you can play around with these materials a lot, and they stay in this bad metallic phase and are not going to a mod insulator easily. Yeah? These are the Hund's metals. The question is now, uh, what does spin-orbit coupling do to this? Yeah? How is this picture changed when you in, in, include spin-orbit coupling? And uh, this is just another uh, sketch of this so-called Hund's tail. So you have no spin-orbit coupling and you have this, uh, uh, the randomization, with, this is the inverse effective mass. And as function of interactions, this has this, uh, this shape. Yeah? Now if you add spin-orbit coupling, this goes away. So the, the thing to remember is this Hund's tail, which you call the low coherence tail, this vanishes. I will explain to you later that this is not so surprising. Uh, there's one thing, maybe uh, you should not look at the details and there's no time to explain this so much, but this would be the calculation if you replace the spin-orbit coupling by this tetragonal crystal field. Yeah? So instead of uh, shifting the two uh, subsets away by spin orbit coupling, you just do it with a crystal field, with a tetragonal crystal field. This is much more effective in destroying this Hund's metallic thing. And to our understanding, this comes exactly from this difference, yeah? That if you just have a tetragonal crystal field, your interacting Hamiltonian stays the same. You still have this, uh, this uh, what some people call spin locking mechanism, that you want to have a large spin, and this cannot move then anymore. So this is very correlated, but if you don't have this mechanism, there are a lot of fluctuations, so the, the thing is much more metallic if you lose this, this term that is uh, not there anymore in, in the transformed Hamiltonian. Is that connected to uh, Sergei's law? <clears throat> I guess so. I mean, uh, I had now one hour to think about this, but I could not come up with... The point is n equals 2, for instance, is very different to n equals 3 which we will see in a minute. So two electrons is very different from half filling. So maybe uh, since time is running, uh, I will, um, this I can skip, this is not really important. So the, the osmates is now a D equals two system. Yeah, This is a double perovskite osmate, and this is an insulator. And I just flash you what we got for the calculation. We do DFT plus DMFT calculations. So we calculate the actual band structure. Uh, use here the same interaction values as for the iridate. Yeah? So u equals 2 and j 0.3, just to be on draft values which are reasonable. And uh, when you do the calculations in DFT, you see that no spin orbit coupling, no interactions, this is clearly a metal with a small splitting due to a non perfectly cubic crystal structure. Um, if you do then a DMFT calculation without spin-orbit coupling, you end up with the gap, but that's not an insulator. I mean, okay, it's a pseudo gap. So you, you kind of decrease the density of states, but it's not insulating. And the reason is you cannot really fully polarize the system. Yeah? So you, you cannot uh, get rid of this little bit of charge in the higher lying orbital. Now, if you start with the spin-orbit coupled calculation, now here, of course, you have now uh, three different values, so they are not degenerate anymore because of this non-perfect cubic crystal structure. 
Um, and you start already with some polarization. And if you now do correlated calculations, so including the Hubbard U, you get completely rid of this one half. Yeah? And now you end up again in a two orbital, two electron situation, which we call half filling. And this is the one that is most correlated. And that's why it's an insulator. Yeah? But the reason why this is then becoming an insulator is that you can get rid of this one half. Yeah? So this really needs to be biospin orbit coupling and correlations needs to be emptied out. Otherwise, it's not an insulator. OK? Now, I told you a lot of uh, details. So to say there is one thing which is a bit more universal. I have only one more slide. And that is uh, coming from the self-energy. There is no mathematical argument for this. Yeah? We just saw it in all our calculations that we did. If you define something which you call an effective spin-orbit coupling, it's nothing else than the coupling that you have in your system, plus, uh, if you do this transformation, a part coming from correlations from the self-energy, this is always larger. Yeah? So the effective spin-orbit coupling always increases from correlation effects. That does not mean that correlations increase, it just means the effective spin-orbit coupling increases. So if you have an idea of what spin-orbit spin coupling does with your system, you might have an idea of what the correlations enhance in that way. What I mean with it, it might be in any way is if you look at half-filling. Half-filling, no spin-orbit coupling, so n equals 3 in 3 electrons is a very strong insulator. Now if you increase spin-orbit coupling, you make it less co correlated. Yeah? So you cannot say that the general argument is that spin-orbit coupling always enhance correlations, but in this system, it decorrelates the system. So if you are at, at one point of U, um, without spin-orbit coupling, it's an insulator here. And if you add spin-orbit coupling to your, uh, to your material, you end up here then in a metallic solution because you cross this phase transition between uh, green and, and black. The only thing to remember here in this half field situation is that the lambda values here are very large. Yeah? So that's why normally in all the calculations that, uh, that we do for half field systems, like technetium oxides and so on, uh, you can, for the first approximation, neglect the spin-orbit coupling. Are you trying to say that effectively uh, spin-orbit coupling reduces the bandwidth, and therefore the competition between the bandwidth... No, this is not what I'm going to say. It's the, the off-diagonal part of the sigma, of the self-energy that changes, not the diagonal part. So the, the thing that... The point in the, in the self-energy that is corrected that connected to the spin-orbit coupling component of your Hamiltonian. This is always increased. So you cannot say anything from the outset about the diagonal of the self-energy, which would give you an effective mass. This you cannot. Let me follow up with this question. Uh, can you alternatively say that uh, because of spin-orbit, essentially energy gain of creating two parallel electrons uh, becomes reduced? Yes, yes, I, yes, and this is I would, what I would say. reduces the effect of Hund and reduces it, weakens the tendency to create Hund's metal. For the Hund's metal case, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that would yeah. be more or Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. What's actually the definition of Hund's metal? There is no real definition. <laughs> I mean... So, I think in that phase diagram, the part which is a metal... Okay, now this is the, the this is the one, this is the one part which I skipped, okay, now give me one minute. Yeah, the Hund's metal is exactly this guy here. It's at, at filling off, half filling between the, the mod transition for this actual doping or filling and the corresponding uh, metal insulator transition at the difference. Picture, when you had this, all this, uh, this the tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you well, when you see an S shape in your C, yes. This is yes. what we call Hund. Yeah, yeah, Hund's metal yeah. Donor, yeah. No but it's related to the closeness to this mod state, yeah. Okay, now, I mean, I really went longer than I wanted, but I think I'm done. Yes, so these are my conclusions, and these are the people that worked on this for many years, uh, different points in many years, let's say. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs>